Okay, so where we left off, we covered a few things, uh, a few interesting introductory topics about Google advertising, big picture, Google, stuff like that. Today, we're basically gonna dig into AdWords and AdSense and then a uh, bigger picture comparison of online versus traditional offline advertising. Okay, so these are all the things we covered, spam blogs, click-through rate, competitive bidding, quality score, day parting optimization. So big picture stuff, <clears throat> The common method that uh, Google uses to get paid is it shows ads, and if somebody clicks on them, Google gets paid by the advertiser. It's generally how it works. Uh, there are other methods though. Second, there's a competitive bidding model. So wherever advertisers want their ads to appear, they can bid on that. And the other part is a quality score. Google assesses basically how good the ad is and when it has the available data, how good the associated website is because advertisers are trying to bring people to their websites in most cases. So Google looks at all that to develop a quality score for the ad. Basically, so the idea is it's a, a long run estimation of how much money Google will get from the ad or how many clicks Google will get on the ad. So the end result is that Google wants to maximize the product of the bid times the number of clicks, right? Because you can have an ad that gets a lot of clicks, but if the bid is low, it's not doing much for Google. Likewise, you can have an ad where the advertisers bid really high, but if it's not getting any clicks, it's not doing anything for Google. So those two factors together determine where the ad is gonna get shown. Google wants to show the best ads in the best places. And then one strategy that firms can use to help optimize that is something called day parting optimization. So however they can figure it out, if they can figure out that some ads are better at some times of the day, then those ads will get shown in that context. For example, we do a quick practical example on that. Suppose it's 930 in the morning and I'm doing a Google search for pizza. Well, pizza delivery. You're not going to see a lot of ads for, holy shit. And here they are at 930 already. I mean, maybe, not delivery, let's see, just pizza. Usually we don't get this. Well, damn, I guess 930 did the cutoff. All right, well, shut my mouth. Anyway, previous instances where I have done this, I did not see pizza ads at 930 in the morning, but I guarantee you, if you do pizza ads at say nine at night, you'll see a lot more ads. I am surprised that Domino's, does Domino's even deliver at this hour? Hours. Yeah, they're not even open yet. They're running ads and they're not even open. That's crazy. All right. So we got that. But that's the idea. So firms can decide when it makes sense to show their ads when it doesn't. And if they show their ads only at the times that it makes sense, then their quality score is going to appear higher because they're going to get more clicks on their ads. So Basically, that means they won't have to pay as much to Google to get their advertising because their quality score will appear higher. They can appear in the equivalent location, even with a lower bid. All right, so that's all the stuff we covered the other day for those of you that this is your first time back. And now we'll get going forward. Okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking about this. Okay, so the two big platforms we're going to talk about, AdWords and AdSense. So AdWords fundamentally is Google showing ads along with search terms, primarily on Google.com. And AdSense is Google showing ads on third-party sites, for example, blogs. But, you know, there's a wide variety of other sites that use Google Ads. But AdWords is primarily for Google, but also for other sites that are closely affiliated with Google, like, say, YouTube. Uh, and AdSense, of course, is for sites without a close affiliation with Google. All right, so that's that's the difference. Now, with AdWords, excuse me, I got something going on in my head today. Uh, with uh, AdWords, advertisers are going to pay Google if somebody clicks on them, and then Google gets all that money. On you know, if it's a, if it's Google, it's easiest to talk about it as if it's just Google. Of course, if it's another site, there's some revenue sharing that happens. With AdSense, Google puts ads on non-Google pages. And then if somebody clicks on the ad, the advertisers pay Google and Google pays a cut of that to the page owner. So to the blogger, that's the model. Now, 
there's a lot of data involved, as you might guess, right? There's uh, Google has to do some analysis of how the site is set up. So they have to send uh, browser bots out to scan the site and see how well it's set up. Uh, there could be a lot of analytics data that Google gets just from people visiting the site. Then Google has to look at how the advertisement performs over time. Are people clicking on it or not? Under what circumstances are they clicking? For example, different times of day, different geographic locations. Are they getting more clicks for, uh, for example, for users using different browsers? Uh, and in some cases, they can even look at different hardware. For example, optimizing pixel sizes by region. Uh, in Europe, for example, one of the things Google does in different countries, different uh, tablets and smartphone sizes are popular and they'll have uh, different pixel sizes for the screen. So Google will try to show ads that are optimized for those. Anyway, this is a lot of data. And if you have it all, you can make better decisions about where to show the ads. If you make better decisions about where to show the ads, then naturally they're going to get more clicks and you're going to make money. So this is a, another example of economies of scale. So once Google has all this data, they can pick where to put the ads and make more money off of it. And that's an advantage that other companies can't easily replicate. So the Bings of the world, for example, and I hear that Apple is just starting work on a new search engine because uh, there's some antitrust legislation pending against Google. We'll see how that goes. I mean, it's a major lawsuit. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but most of these companies, they cannot seriously compete with Google in terms of data, right? They're just, they just don't have it. So anyway, so Google wants to maximize its ad revenue. And this is a massive, massive big data problem. They have a lot of ads. They have a lot of different search terms, a lot of different websites. And one problem is that different ads could perform differently in different contexts, right? So one ad could be great on one site, not so good at another. And these are the little wrinkles that Google has to try to figure out. Uh, another problem, for example, if Google just picked the best ad, right? There's like, oh, there's one best ad and showed it everywhere. Well, pretty soon it would stop being the best ad, right? Everybody would have seen it. So the question is, how does Google mix up the variety of ads as well in order to maximize its revenue? So these are, these are very interesting and complicated problems. And you can be assured that Google has top people working on it because there's billions and billions of dollars at stake. Anyway, so, but as a rule, Google wants to assign the best performing ads to the best spaces that are available. So as far as Google has space available, it's gonna pick some sub, subset of its best performing ads to show there, and it's gonna mix them up somehow. So it doesn't just you know blanket the world in one ad for an hour or so. Other questions in terms of building this model, how far in time back should Google track the data, right? Should it track it a year, two years, five years, a month, a week? Yeah, so Google basically mixes that up too and tries to see if the results, you know, if it says, well, let's run a model where we're only uh, showing something, we're only looking at the past month of data to predict ads. This is basically like A-B testing for websites, right? So just like, like a website you might run different page versions and use analytics to determine whoop, which page performs best. Google can do the same thing by using different models to select the ads Right, so things like time window, uh, ranking metrics, and then go forward with whatever works. So it was basically learning about what works and what doesn't work in the same way the websites do it with A-B testing, Google's basically doing it with its entire network of, of uh, partner sites. Anyway. So there's that. So the basics of how AdWords works. Well, again, Google ranks ads with search terms. So key factors, number one, which terms? So Google has a massive library of search terms. Some of them will have ads associated with them. Some of them won't. Google's always happy to have people run ads on them, but 
if nobody's willing to make the, the floor bid, for example, uh, one that I typically don't see ads for is the word eagles, which I've done. I mean, if I, if I had something like, say, trilobite, you all know what a trilobite is, like an ancient prehistoric fish crab thing from like 500 million years ago? Yeah, those are what trilobites are. Anyway, I can't imagine there would be a lot of ads around trilobites because nobody's going to bid on that, right? But if I do uh, trilobite fossil for sale, well, there's probably going to be some ads. Yeah, boom, there's a bunch of ads for fossils. Okay, so it depends on what people, advertisers are willing to bid on. Anyway, so those are the big factors. Uh, number one, selecting the search terms in the first place, and advertisers have control to do that. They basically, within their AdWords software, they say, ah, I want to bid on such and such terms. And then those terms are going to vary in terms of how many people see them and the quality of the traffic. Basically, if somebody is searching for that, how likely are they to click on an ad? And if they click on the ad, how likely are they to buy something? So, for example, right, we'll do this specific case. Perhaps trilobites as a, let's say, a 1% click-through rate and a 1% say purchase per click. Okay, basically meaning you have to show the ad 10,000 times to get one purchase. So you wouldn't be willing to pay much. I mean, if you look at what's for sale on this, right? If we look at uh, trilobite fossils for sale, I mean, some of these, they're like five bucks, right? Three bucks, they're not very expensive things unless you wanna get one of the super fancy, super rare things and you could pay a few hundred, I don't know, okay? But anyway, people are not willing to pay a lot for these, this kind of click traffic because the product itself is not that valuable. All right, however, let's say trilobite, Fossil for sale, maybe that, right, has a, let's say a 10% click-through rate and a, let's say a 50% purchase per click, okay? And let's say every, uh, and we'll further throw in, every purchase is valued at, I don't know, let's say 20 bucks. And that's how much it's worth. So try to buy a fossil for sale, 10% click through rate, 50% purchase rate per click, basically 5%, right? So you show the ad 20 times, you get one purchase worth $20. So roughly you could afford to pay $1 per uh, showing of the ad. Or, right, 50% purchase per click or $10 per click. But you wouldn't pay that much. Because you have no profit after. Okay, that's just, that's like the upper bound of what you'd be willing to pay. So anyway, the advertisers, they crunch all these numbers. They have numbers about how many people are going to see the ads. Once they run an ad along with it, they see how valuable the traffic is and they can decide to continue bidding on it or not. So what usually happens, advertisers start with lowish bids to get their toes in the water, right, cheaply, and then they see how it goes. I mean, it doesn't make sense right off the bat to pay $500 per click and hope that works great, right? You start off with low bids and your ad won't get seen as much because it's a low bid, so it's not gonna be in the best spot, but if it's not getting seen at all, well, you know you gotta bump it up a little bit and eventually it starts getting seen, then you start deciding, well, is this, add with the traffic that we're getting, are we paying a fair price to Google for? Are we paying too much or not enough? If you're not paying enough, then that's a nice problem to have.
Okay. Now, over time, uh, the increasing adoption of AdWords has really driven up costs quite a bit. And the main reason is you can't share space at the top. So for however many people there are on the internet that are bidding on these terms, right, if there are more of them, that's going to push up the demand for that one spot at the top. And the bid prices in general are going to go up. So consequence, because AdWords has been around for 20 years or so, and so there have been a lot, there are a lot more uh, businesses in than when it first started. Early on, like circa 2003 or so, you could just pretty much bid on any terms and you'd have a decent shot of making some money. But now the field is so crowded, you really have to target in. So instead of just bidding on shoes or even Chicago shoes, you might have to do, you know, women's shoes downtown Chicago or men's shoes Lincoln Park, something like that, or, you know, affordable dentistry by UIC. You have to be much more specific if you're going to show up as uh, relevant for those terms. The other part, of course, free Google Analytics has brought in many more businesses using AdWords. Remember, the main reason why Google offers Google Analytics for free is because it wants to encourage businesses to use its other advertising platforms, and Google Analytics is a way that the businesses can see that the advertising is working. Okay, so anyway, history and development, a little bit of a backstory. So AdWords started in 2000. It was actually developed outside of Google, and I'm not saying that Google stole the idea, but I can tell you that there were some idea ownership lawsuits, intellectual property lawsuits that were settled out of court and Google paid some money. So uh, there's, you know, theft happens in tech. Uh, sometimes it's obvious and direct. Sometimes it's a little bit sneakier, like Google hires people that used to work on a project at another firm. And they, you know, even if they don't specifically know some stuff, they might, you know, whisper something or maybe behind doors they do work on the project, even though they have like a non-compete clause after hiring. Or it could be that, you know, there's a few tech engineers sitting in a bar after work one day and they talk, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're making this neat thing that we're going to do an advertising platform. Oh, that sounds good. How's it going to work? Well, let me tell you all about it. Right. And people have uh, people share the secrets, whatever. So however it happened. Google paid some people off and the problem went away. Anyway, uh, Google wasn't the only company that was doing this at the time. There were a bunch of people trying to figure out how to make money off of ads associated with search results. Most of those other operations did not survive the dot-com bust of the early 2000s. Uh, currently, similar business models are operated by Bing, okay, which is by Microsoft. Yahoo used to have its own independent thing, but now it's under the Bing umbrella as well. Anyway, right now, AdWords is Google's main revenue source. Ballpark number, 75% or so of Google's revenues. And it's a virtuous cycle because Google has high quality ads. And I mean, high quality in terms of they bring in a lot of money per ad to Google. That brings in more revenues and those revenues can be invested in technology and tools to improve the system's performance. Okay. So unlike say Bing, which suffers from some budget troubles, the basic idea is this. For Google, suppose it makes 100 billion in revenue per year from AdWords, okay, which is roughly correct. And say for Bing, suppose it makes, let's say 10 billion. I'm probably being generous, but let's say 10 billion per year. Again, per year, dot, dot, dot. Now, suppose Google wants to implement a major new feature in its ad selection process that will cost, well, let's say 10 billion up front, but will revenues by 5% per year, okay? Google will make that money back in two years, right? It's a good deal for them, right? So 5% on 100 billion is 5 billion. Google's gonna make that cost back, right? And just in terms of revenue, not necessarily profit. But in terms of revenue, it's gonna make that money back in two years. So yeah, it's a good deal for them. But for Bing, right? 
$10 billion up front improved by 5%. That's a lot, right? How long will it take Bing? Well, for Bing, it will take 10 times as long to recoup the investment cost. Probably not a good deal. So this is the basic thing. Because Google is bigger, these expensive options that can make financial sense for Google are not gonna make so much sense for smaller players, right? Whether it's in terms of installing new hardware, building a new system, grabbing more data, whatever stuff they gotta do, Google can afford to uh, work a little harder to get these, you know, to squeak out these incremental improvements and Bing kinda can't. Well, I mean, maybe it can in a few years as the cost of these systems come down, comes down, but they're always gonna be trailing along in Google's wake. Okay, the other thing about uh, AdWords, it's extensible. So it was designed to take advantage of the fact that internet participation by users and by businesses was increasing. So it didn't make sense to set any fixed prices. You wanted to let prices float upward because that would be all to Google's benefit as demand for spaces at the top for showing ads increased. Okay, now the basic process for AdWords, again, Business is gonna select the search terms, uh, could look at existing traffic course sources or potential traffic sources. So for example, if their site's already running Google Analytics, they can look through and see the set of search terms that people are using to arrive at their site, right? So that gives them an idea, ah, here's how people are finding us. And then they can bid on those same terms or they can bid on similar terms. Once they've selected the search terms, then they compare the results against the cost, right? Are these bids that we're making First of all, are we getting any traffic? The traffic that we're getting, are they buying now? Do we think they're gonna buy in the future? Basically compare the results against what, what the traffic costs. And then update any paid search terms. So they say, ah, these terms aren't working. Let's, uh, let's drop them, let's lower our bids. Uh, maybe some other terms are working really well. We can afford to bid a little bit more on those to try to bring more traffic in by you know, getting a better spot in the ad presentation. And then over time, review the relevance. So for example, if you're releasing new products or your older products are going away or they're <clears throat> being retitled in some way, yeah, you might wanna change the terms that uh, you're advertising along with. And for example, any current ad campaigns you're doing, for example, if McDonald's ever changes its slogan from I'm loving it to whatever, da, 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 it's in a bag, I don't know. They'll, they'll change something there and set their search terms to go along with that. Okay. Now, we have a case study, if you care to read it. I hope some people have read it. We'll uh, come back and talk about some of those Google Analytics cases in a bit too, at the end of lecture today. But there's one in there about Blue Creek cabins that I'm just gonna discuss for a little bit. And then you guys can go ahead and read it on your own. It's not going to be directly tested on the exam, but I hope it will make some of these uh, things that we're talking about be a little bit less abstract. So it's a concrete example of how one uh, company, right, one small business experienced Google's AdWords. So, so first thing, 2003, Blue Creek Cabins, basically a small rental cabin operation in the rural South, uh, I believe Georgia, uh, the United States, not the country. So Blue Creek Cabins started advertising with AdWords. Initially, just wonderful, right? Got lots of valuable traffic and, you know, so the usage by Blue Creek Cabins increased. Uh, over the next few years, let's say circa 2008, Many more businesses bidding on the same search terms as Blue Creek Cabins uh, no longer makes clear financial sense. Reduced the uh, usage of AdWords, right? a more focused approach. Okay. Finally, right at the end, uh, 2011 or so, 
this. Still using AdWords, but on a much more limited scale. Then what else? Uh, shift to SEO, search engine optimization. Getting the Blue Creek Cabin site to rank higher in ordinary or organic search and thus not pay for ads, right? Which is great. If you can get people to your business without advertising, uh, without paying for advertising, that's great. Part of this uh, strategy one, including more content that helps rank the site higher. Um, and the other two is, you know, basically better evaluation of which terms are profitable. And third, stable business. Okay, so that, that's an important thing. When you're just getting started as a business, you kind of got to advertise to let anybody know you're out there, especially if you're, you know, a rental cabin operation way out in the middle of nowhere. How are people even going to know about that business unless you advertise somehow? So. When you're a new business, yeah, you get out there and you get the word out and you're willing to pay more for that traffic. However, as you're a stable business and you have a, you know, a pool of repeat customers, you have other options. You have some word of mouth, you can uh, remarket the product to people, you, know, you send out notes, hey, you were here last year, hope you had a great time, here's a 10% discount on the next time you come out. Do stuff like that. And you don't need, you don't have so many cabins that have to be filled through advertisements advertisements anymore. Maybe, you know, maybe 75% of your cabins are filled most of the time just by ordinary repeat business. So you still got to advertise to bring in some new people because some of your customers are going to move away, get old, die, decide they don't like camping, whatever. Uh, they're going to go away. You got to refill some of that, but you don't have to fill up your whole operation with customers. So advertising is very important to get your business off the ground, but once it's a little bit stable, you could back off normally anyway. Okay, so this is basically the trajectory, more or less, that the operation follows. And if you read the article, you'll see that. Okay, so Ad AdSense, on the other hand, AdSense is a little different. It runs ads along on other pages, not on Google's pages. So it's a customizable model for generating advertisement revenue. Uh, it's actually very similar to print media models. So in a newspaper, you have a big sheet of paper and an advertiser can say, oh, I want to run a half page ad, quarter page ad, smaller ads, whatever. The advertiser gets to pick the size of the ad they want to run. And basically it works the same way on a website. The website has so many pages and the, advertise, the website says, well, I will allow you to put an ad, you know, this big or a cluster of ads this big on my page. And Google brings in the ads to fill up that space. All right. So just like Google Analytics, it's free to participate. So obviously it's not gonna cost the website anything because you know, they're doing Google a favor, right? They, Google's gonna pay them for it, but wouldn't make sense to pay. Uh, when somebody clicks on the ads, right? Then the, Google gets paid and then the Google takes a cut of that, typically around 40% and pays that to the site owner. Now this whole idea of advertising for web content, this is a big problem for the internet. So. 25 years ago, there were a lot of businesses that's, or a lot of, uh, you know, blogs or other sorts of informational content. They wanted to provide content, but they wanted to get paid for it, right? So how do they do that? Problem with, the, with TV, you can broadcast TV and people see it live, and if they want to see it live, they got to watch some commercials to deal with it. On the internet, though, if the content is interesting, people can just show up and look at it and go away. And if it's really interesting, right, like it's uh, music or movies or something, people can just copy it and watch it that way. So how are they going to make money? This, again, very big problem. Now, early on, most sites were just showing random untargeted ads. So you went to a site and there'd be some big banner at the top that chances are wasn't anything like relevant to you. So most people ignored almost all of the advertising. Once in a while, you'd click on one of those ads. Like I remember in the late 90s, I finally got interested enough to, one of these ads says, you're the millionth visitor to this site, click here for your free prize, whatever. And I knew I wasn't the millionth visitor, but I wanted to see what the ads were about. So I clicked on it and it just ended up 
asking for a whole bunch of personal information about me, like 20 screens into that, I said, ah, forget it, I'm never getting to the end of this, I quit. So, problem is, after something like that, you never click on one of those banner ads again. And I'm pretty sure I never again intentionally did. So the problem is, if there's this unfocused advertising, number one, most people are going to ignore it, so it's not gonna get any clicks, and it's not gonna get any revenue. Second thing is, if it's really irrelevant, or you know, even borderline malicious, then once people click on that and find that out, then they're really going to stay away from the advertising. So unfocused advertising is terrible. It's a waste of time. It's not going to make any money for the site and the advertisers, you know, it's almost worthless to them as well. So how does Google fix it? Well, Google fixes it by trying to show ads that are fairly relevant to the content on the site. All right, so AdSense, it's the dominant product in its category, right? This, there are other models out there, business models, uh, products for running ads on sites, but AdSense is the big one all by itself. It's something like 20% or so of Google's business. All by itself, it's bigger than you know almost anybody. So uh, it's released in 2003, right? It was developed outside Google, but legitimately acquired, so no lawsuits there. And current annual revenue, something in the ballpark of 15 billion right? Probably less than 20. So I guess about 10% of uh, Google's revenues these days. Uh, there are some threats to it. Number one, uh, ad blocking software is going to stop people from even seeing the ads. And of course, the general shift from desktop to mobile usage and proprietary apps. So once upon a time, most people used desktops or laptops to get to the internet and do stuff. And that was great. You put a lot of ads on the pages, right? Nowadays, mobile devices, there's not as much room for ads proprietary apps like uh, say the Amazon app, people aren't needing so much uh, advertising. For Amazon, once upon a time, they used to pay Google like $200 million a year in ads. So they had a big drive to create this app and stop paying Google so much. Anyway, not everybody's always happy with AdSense. For one, uh, the ad selection is driven by web page context and measuring what a page is about is a lot tougher than measuring what search terms are about. Uh, it just, it just doesn't work as well. But the reason why you need to do it is fundamentally this. Anytime a visitor gets to the Google search results page, you know their search terms, right? But for other sites, using AdWord, AdSense rather, they could arrive through a direct channel, thus no search terms, right? They could arrive through an ad, again, no search terms, right? They could have, they could have done paid or organic search, right? It's organic. Let's list that as referral, right? Just, just to distinguish organic or paid via Google. You go through social media, through some email ad, right? Whatever, there's, in most cases, there's not going to be any search term. So if Google is going to show relevant ads on a site, on a non-Google site, it definitely needs to assess site content. Otherwise, it can't assess ad relevance. So it's an imperfect system, but it's kind of what Google has to do because not everybody's getting to these sites using search terms. Okay. So, and there's a lot of imperfection. For number one, Google, sometimes uh, the context is not perfectly assessed. Number two, quite often people searching about a product may not be interested in buying it. For example, if I just wanna see some pictures of trilobite fossils, doesn't mean I'm looking to buy one. And of course, accidental page views are more likely than entering the wrong search terms. People click on the wrong thing all the time, but it's pretty hard to type in an entirely wrong word, especially now that Google does the, uh, you know, the spell checking thing pretty well. Look, identifies misspelled words. Okay, so the AdSense revenue model, again, 
Google's revenue streams gets from advertiser bids, similar to bidding for search listings. So there are sets of content types, basically categories, and advertisers will bid on those. And it's very similar to bidding on search terms. Again, pay-per-click from advertisers is the dominant model. The affiliates, the sites that are running the ads, don't pay anything to Google. So what do the affiliates get? A fraction of that pay-per-click. And there's a variable rate depending on how effective the advertisements are. So an ad that gets, a site that gets more legitimate traffic and more legitimate clicks will tend to get something closer to 50%, whereas a site that, you know, is more marginal might get, you know, closer to 40%. Anyway, AdSense is very popular with bloggers, referral sources, other informational sites. Any site that wants to make money but isn't selling a product, you know, they want to advertise. Same as uh, TV shows on, on network TV. Okay. Now, we can always talk about how we could subvert this model, how we could make it work in the way that it's not supposed to work. So, basic model, something called revenue inflation. With revenue inflation, uh, Basically, the site owner is clicking on the ads on their own site in order to generate some extra money. So you have unemployed blogger decides, hey, I'd really like a pizza, but I'm unemployed and I can't afford one. So I'm going to click on my own ads and get like $10 a day or $10 a week. So this is a problem, right? And it's something that Google is very aware of. And it's the big reason why Google is more cautious about AdSense and giving revenue there than it is on uh, its own site or its partner, close partner sites because it trusts them. It basically says, well, you're some blogger. I don't know you. Maybe you're legitimate, maybe you're not, but we're gonna keep a closer eye on you guys. Another possibility is trying to attack competitors. Uh, I'm not saying this actually happens, but it is certainly something to potentially be concerned about. For example, suppose you are Walmart and you are trying to outsell Target in some market. So you write a script that looks for ads involving Target and you click on all those ads. Well, every time you click on one of those Target ads with your phony browser bot, then Target's gonna have to pay some money. That's a problem for Target. Uh, what'll happen in practice, every company that's using AdWords or AdSense, they have a daily budget of how much they're willing to pay. So it's not like there's no upper bound to what you'll pay during the day. You set a daily budget and if you exceed that, then Google is just going to stop running your ads because you don't have any money left to pay for the clicks. So what will happen, number one, if Walmart's bot clicks on Target ads, first of all, Target will have to pay some money out. Number two, Target will, Target's ads will stop being shown. And number three, Walmart won't have to bid as much because it knows, oh, you know, half an hour into the day, Target's going to burn through its budget and then there'll be space for us. So if nobody was aware of what was going on, that's the sort of thing that could happen. But of course, if Google noticed that, you know, hey, there's this flood of clicks on Target stuff early in the day, and none of those clicks are actually buying something, Google would pretty quickly figure out something was up. And of course, spam blogs, right? Spam blogs are a problem. If you just have a garbagey site that's packed with ads, Google's going to recognize that and say, oh, yeah, this is a garbagey site. Uh, there's no meaningful content here. You're done. We're, you're out of the network. So Google has to evaluate traffic uh, versus good and bad. So good traffic is potentially cus potential customers intentionally clicking on ads. So it's not a guarantee that they're going to buy the stuff, but there is a you know reasonable non-zero probability that they will. On the other hand, you have worthless or worse traffic, right? So worthless traffic would be invalid. So people who accidentally click on the ads. And typically what happens, somebody clicks on the ad by mistake, they and they quickly bounce away. Now you'll sometimes see this on pages that just after the page loads, there'll be a little bit of jitter, right? When you try to click on a link near the top and just as you hover over it, boom, the page will jump so that you clicked on an ad you didn't mean to. Yeah, they like to do stuff like that to try to sneak in some extra money. Again, Google detects that sort of thing pretty quickly, but they still try to do it. So, and of course, just legitimate accidental clicks. The other thing is click fraud, right? Intentional clicks by non-customers. The unemployed blogger who wants $10 for pizza clicking on his own ad. So how does Google tell the difference? Yeah. Well, we'll tell about that in a minute. <clears throat> so click fraud drives up advertising costs in two ways. First of all, right, and by here, we mean customers. We mean customers using Google service, so the advertisers. So in the short term, the advertisers will pay more without receiving an increase in sales. So they don't like that. They're going to have to pay more. Number two, long-term, 
Google's going to have to invest in click fraud detection technology, click fraud detection activities. They're going to have to monitor this stuff. And that entails some costs. And basically, Google's going to have to make that back somehow. So it means it's going to have to sell the surface service as at a higher price to the advertisers. Now, Google's situation, because Google is so big, it's going to draw almost all of the click fraud activity, right? Just like way more people write uh, malware to hit Windows machines than they do to hit Apple machines, because there's a lot more Windows, you know, there's a lot more PCs out there than Macs. And this actually is a significant factor inhibiting AdSense's growth, right? So Google's a little bit concerned about click fraud. Advertisers are very concerned about it. They say, well, you know, if I run these ads through you, how do I know that this isn't just the unemployed blogger clicking on them? Okay, and so because of that, a lot of advertisers are somewhat reluctant to advertise with it. Now, Google says, they say they detect over 90% of spam traffic, right? But it's hard to know the true figure. The reason is this, imagine if you, found that you had some roaches in your house. And you said, man, I don't want roaches in my house. That's some bad news. So you call the Orkin guy. And the Orkin guy, he wanders around your house and he hunts roaches for a day or so with a nail gun. And at the end, he brings you this big bag of roaches with holes in them. And he says, I got 90% of them. And you're like, dude, how do you know? Unless you did a total population check on all the roaches, you know that you, know, you have nine bags of roaches. You're telling me there's like absolutely one full bag of roaches still running around. And if so, why didn't you catch them, right? So this is the basic measurement problem. But the way they do it is something like this. If you're wondering, hey, how does Google estimate that 90%? Well, they have this batch of data. And whatever, they have some kind of curve. So we'll say uh, we'll quantity and this is the uh, index of badness, okay? So they have some batch of data that looks, let's make it a, we'll make it a, a bell curve-ish. Okay, so their curve of data looks something like this. Now, Google might say, for sure, we all know this is bad. This is so far out in bad field that we know this is bad traffic. And they might also know, well, this, this is so close to good that we're really sure that this is good traffic. But this window here, right, this yellow zone, yeah, that, that we're not so sure about, right? Some of it's probably bad, some of it's probably good, and it's kind of got a mix in there. So this is what's going on. They say, yeah, we're pretty sure that all this is good. We're pretty sure that all this is bad. How much of this? Yeah, we're not exactly sure. That, that's where the wiggle room comes in. Okay, so what, what I'm saying is they don't detect all of it. They detect a lot of the, they detect the obvious bad traffic. For example, if unemployed blogger shows up at his site every morning at, you know, 11 in the morning when he wakes up and he clicks on the same ad three times and he does that a few days in a row, Google's going to say, yeah, that, that pattern is implausible, right? It's from the same IP address, same guy shows up, clicks on the same ads a few times. Yeah, probably not, probably not real. Right. Likewise, if you come up with some bot program that clicks on your ads a thousand times a day, Google's just going to laugh and say, yeah, that, that's never happening. However, if your site gets a fair amount of traffic, like 10,000 visitors a day, and on a typical day, a couple hundred of them are clicking on ads. And once in a while, you yourself go to a Starbucks and on a different machine, you visit your own site and click on an ad. Yeah, Google's probably not going to catch that one. That, that's probably something that people are going to do, right? So anyway, that, that's, that's something. Now, the way Google detects uh, this, very similar to email spam filters. Basically, uh, Google builds a profile of what normal human-like behavior would look like. So it would be intermittent visits to sites. It would be most visits do not result in clicks. It would be you don't come back to the same site day after day and click on it. If you violate any of that stuff, Google's gonna say, yeah, you know what? This is probably not an actual human. This is uh, either you know, click fraud by a human or by a bot, something. So 
the attackers, the guys that are doing this professionally, they try to run right at the edge of what Google classifies as click fraud. So they'll try some different stuff. They see what they get away with. If they do get away with it, they know, ah, we can get away with that. So let's, let's that be our threshold. And again, periodically Google changes its model to detect this, this sort of fraud. So the uh, bad guys are kind of experimenting periodically as well to see what works. Now again, sometimes click fraud is really obvious, like impossibly high traffic from one source, one machine, one IP address, whatever, or recurring patterns from the same sources to the same destination. If you have this IP address that repeatedly visits the site like the same time every day and clicks on ads, right? Nobody visits a site every day and clicks on multiple ads on that site every day. So Google's going to detect that. Uh, but if you have random changing groups of machines, for example, if you have a botnet that intermittently flares up and clicks on a few sites, um, or if you randomly change the target ads, for example, you have a botnet that participates with a network of blogs and periodically visit, you know, sends out hundreds of thousands of visits every day with a small chance, like uh, you know, half a percent that it's going to click on one of those ads, and it and it's random, then yeah, you got a better shot. And of course, any activity that's small scale, you're gonna get away, you're gonna be much more likely to get away with, right? So same thing as the grocery store. If you try to sneak out of the grocery store with a shopping cart full of grapes, you're gonna get busted. But if you're walking through the grapes and you know, you pop one off and eat it, probably nobody's gonna, you know, nobody's gonna say anything. They're like, yeah, it's kind of the cost of doing business. So that's how Google does it. Last stuff, online versus traditional advertising. So we got a few slides here. We're gonna wrap this up and then we'll take a few minutes to talk about some of these uh, analytics case studies. Okay, so traditional versus online advertising. Well, the big ones, radio, TV, and print, they're designed for mass audiences, right? Radio had lar large audiences, TV has large audiences, and print has large audiences, or at least it used to. Anyway, so with all those, the problem is they're all seeing the same thing. If you make an ad, you can't customize it for individual viewers, right? If it's a radio station, you're playing the same radio ad to everybody. TV station, everybody on the East Coast sees one batch, everybody on the West Coast sees one batch. And print, right? Sure, you could make a somewhat different versions of a newspaper for like in Chicago versus in the North suburbs, in the South suburbs, whatever, but it's gonna be pretty much the same. On the other hand, Online, you can do micro segment segmentation, right? You can show different ads uniquely specified even for particular visitors. Um, unlike these traditional models, right, that tend to have flat rates for what an ad costs, you can have scalable rates like pay per click. So if your ad doesn't get much traction, then you don't have to pay much for it. So it reduces the risk to the advertiser. So what's this good for? Well, number one, if you're a large operation, but you have a lot of different products, right? Think companies like Amazon, then you can, sell, you can offer the best product to a particular customer. So one example is, you know, if you've Amazon's own ad API, if you look at products on Amazon and you don't buy them, you add them to your cart, but don't buy them, as you start drifting around the internet, you'll eventually start seeing those same products in Amazon's ads on other pages. Uh, other things, anything that's a small, niche product or a niche store might not be suitable to be on uh, primetime TV for ads because that's too expensive, but yeah, they can run a little pay-per-click campaign. That makes sense. And of course, any business without brand recognition, online is a much uh, more affordable way to do it. It allows them a way to get their toes wet and see what's working for them without going you know, full bore and paying you know, hundreds of thousand dollars in traditional advertising. Okay. Now, the nice things about Google, number one, quantitative focus, there's a lot of data available, and number two, profoundly customizable. So businesses can do it however they want. And this is very different from how radio, TV, and print are, right? Radio, you're typically given you know, a fitted time segment, and it's gotta be that way. TV, you get a fitted segment, you gotta do it that way. And print, same thing. Uh, so. Traditional advertising, there's a lot of guesswork. Uh, one of the ways that they do it, if a business wants to see how well, how well suited is this ad for this particular TV program, well, the first thing you have to do is estimate the audience distribution. So suppose you're selling uh, women's cosmetics and you wanna target that, uh, I don't know, say 25 to 39 age bracket. So you figure out for different TV shows, who watches it, right? How likely those people are to buy your product, 
and then compare that to how much the ad costs. So you try to pay a fair price to target the right people. That all is, you know, basically the same as what Google does, right? You try to, you estimate who's going to see your ad through the set of uh, search terms you advertise along with, and you can estimate that. But the feedback problem is where it really drops off. So with regular advertising on TV, you don't know immediately if somebody sees that ad, likes it, comes to your store and buys stuff. You don't get that connection. On the other hand, with Google, you do. Somebody sees the ad along with the search results, they click on it, they buy the stuff, that's gonna show up immediately in your analytics. So you learn a lot more. You learn about which ads are working and in which context. You, knew, you know how much repetition is worthwhile, right? So do you keep on showing the same ad to the same people? Uh, that's what Google's going to do, right? Does it mix up the ads that get shown along with search terms or does it keep on showing the best ones? And then separating long-term branding from short-term ad campaigns. Again, if you're advertising with Google, you can very quickly see, ah, today's ad worked great. I got something. Or, you know, whereas with, with TV, you wouldn't. With TV, you could look at these long-term branding issues. You could say, well, we spent this much on advertising. And over the year after that, our sales have gone up this much. And we're pretty sure that our advertising is part of that. But with Google, you actually know. You actually know what your ads are doing up front. Uh, and then you have to do a little bit of guesswork on down the line for visits that, visitors that come to your site, look at stuff, but don't buy anything. Some fraction of them you can figure will come back eventually and buy things. So AdWords gives you a lot better insights, uh, both number one, during the setup, because you get very clear details about who's going to see the ads associated with the search terms and in subsequent revision. So as you're revising it, you have more data available through your analytics to look at all that. Okay. Basic way uh, Google does it, uh, basic way advertisers do it with Google, evaluate the value of the search terms. So look at who's using the search terms and then the people who use those terms to see ads and get to your site, you can figure out who's, uh, act, how much money you're getting off of those through sales, how much you're getting immediately and how much you might get down the line, right? For example, people who look at more pages on your site and click on more images are probably more interested in the product and more likely to come back later. And all those things can be monetized uh, based on past data. Now, of course, the results don't have to be perfect, right? Your estimation of how much your advertising is worth doesn't have to be perfect, but you'd like it to be, but it's not. There's gonna be always some guesswork in there. And anytime you try to extrapolate going forward, it's gonna be you know, an imperfect assessment. So you might say, well, if we double our advertising budget, right? if we advertise with a whole bunch of new terms, is that going to double our sales? Well, probably not, because number one, you might have the same people doing multiple sets of search terms. And so even though you advertise with twice as many terms, you're not gonna get that many new people, right? Number two, if these terms are already that great, you'd probably already be advertising with them. So your, the effectiveness of your ads is probably gonna be watered down as you start casting a wider net on the internet. And of course, going forward, the competitive environment may change, right? So for example, more people using mobile devices generally means there's gonna see less ads, right? And especially if they're using the apps. Number two, businesses or entering or exiting a market, you can have new competitors, and of course, changing usage of specific search terms. So any of those factors can change over time and affect how well your ads are doing. Okay, so customization, if you're interested in this stuff, you could see, for example, uh, there are sites like Word Tracker out there where you can see what uh, things, what terms are valuable. So if we look up, I don't know, let's look, uh, Sneakers. How many people are looking up sneakers? Right? It'll tell you a bunch of stuff. Ah, 114,000. Well, that's pretty good. Ooh, silver sneakers is almost, that's very interesting. Golden Goose. I have not heard of them. That must be what all the uh, cool kids are wearing. Anyway, so you can see uh, basically search traffic for various uh, combinations involving sneakers. That data is out there. All right, pricing models. So the question is, what should a business be willing to pay per click? So the idea at number one, figure out some acceptable margin and then estimate the average profit per click through. So if you say, if we make a sale, that's worth say, I don't know, a hundred bucks, right? And you figure that any, that uh, customers visiting your site like 
10% of your customers are going to buy something. If they come to your site with the average value to you being $100, then every click you could potentially pay $10 for and still break even on average. Well, you probably want to pay less. So typically the way businesses do it, they start small and expand later. So they set a small daily budget to start with, say, well, we're going to be on the hook for like 50 bucks or 100 bucks per day. We'll see what happens. Uh, KPIs, key performance indicators, they're going to say, let's, let's look at what we're tracking. And probably what they're going to do is, you know, the number of sales, the amount of sales that are associated with how much uh, this advertising traffic. So monitor that. Say, we would like to track sales. We'd like to track other things that are correlated to future sales, like time on site or pages viewed, other metrics that uh, relate to sales. Anyway, if you're meeting well-designed targets, then the budget shouldn't be an issue, right? If you're actually correct in your assumption that, say, 10% of your site visitors are going to buy something and the average value of that purchase is going to be $100, then it's simple math. You can figure out this is what we can afford to pay. And so the daily budget becomes kind of a non-issue because if you increase that daily budget and your assumptions are correct, that 10% and $100 is going to be pretty stable, right? Even if you raise up your budget a bit, you'll still be making money. So yeah, as long as your, your assumptions are correct, then things will be okay. Of course, they're not. Quite often, it happens that a small business tries to sell something and you know they advertise through Google, people visit the site, but they don't buy anything and then they give up. So it may be that their product just isn't that great in the first place. Okay, other things, the ad types, of course, you can uh, have some influence over the location, right? Whether it appears above or beside search results, whether it appears on uh, Google partner sites or their specific formats for YouTube. For example, uh, YouTube videos, uh, YouTube ads are quite often videos although you do have the static ones as well. And presentation, simple text or pictures, right? So again, we go to these trilobite ads, right? That's what they look like, right? You can have just plain text ones, or you can have ones with pictures. You're gonna pay more for pictures because that's more data that Google has to send out. It's gonna take a longer time. Ooh, Etsy, Etsy will sell me a trilobite fossil. Let's see what they got. Well, I don't know what they're doing, but that is pretty cool. All right. Anyway, Ooh, try to buy face masks. That's fun. All right. Okay, boom, that's it. All right, so we got a little bit of time. I'm gonna ask if anybody has any questions about any of that stuff. If not, I'm gonna go back to the case studies. Questions? Does all this make sense? I hope it does. All right. Well, let's look at a couple of these case studies then. Uh, again, I'm going to encourage people to read them on their own time, but I think we have them. So the ones I want to look at, one for uh, Intuit, and one for sentient. And if you wanna read the ones on guilt and Bausch and Loam on your own, that's fine. So Intuit had an interesting situation. I'll give a walkthrough for that one anyway, then you guys can read it. So let me share too, cause I think I'm not sharing anymore. Yeah. There we go, here I am. Okay, so Intuit, you guys may have heard. Anybody heard of Intuit? What do they do? When you all shout out at once, I can't hear, understand what you're saying. That's all right. Anyway, Intuit uh, is well known for personal and business, financial, and tax preparation software. Okay, so uh, with the flagship product like TurboTax, I'm sure, let's see what we got here in the chat. Somebody dropped the chat bomb. Yes, TurboTax, exactly, exactly. So that's what Intuit does now. And they do it, you know, they have it for personal TurboTax, for example, for individuals and businesses. And they have other personal finance. They have uh, what used to be Microsoft Money Quicken, for example. 
and other products. So all these things, taxes in particular, happen on a you know stable schedule. Personal uh, tax returns are due on 415 every year, except 2020, right? They rolled that back. But in general, April 15th every year. And many people wait until close to the end, right? So probably uh, something like something like half in the window of March 1st to April 15th. So it's pretty tightly focused there. And pretty much no one doing taxes from 416 to 1231, right? Because why? Well, because they don't have the information. The only people that are doing that in that window are people that are filing them late or ask for an extension, something like that. And there just aren't that many of, of those cases in any given year. So because of this, if Intuit wants to learn about its website performance, right? So do some A-B testing, implement changes. It needs the feedback information very quickly, right? That regular Google Analytics standard cycle of 24 to 48 hours just isn't fast enough. They can't do a lot of testing in that window, right? They implement a thing, they implement a change. It takes like a couple days for them to get the data after they start getting the data. So they can do like one change in like maybe three days. They can go through a few of those for different features, but they don't have a lot of time to do this and learn. However, with Google Analytics Premium, Again, now 360, but in the article they call it they call it premium because that's what it was back then. The cycle is two to four hours, meaning they can get feedback much faster and implement good changes much faster. Now a more subtle point on that, not more stubbly, more subtly. What's another thing? Well, if your window is three days, if your change cycle is three days, you're probably forced to test groups of changes, not specific individual site components and features, right? You basically say, Here's one template. Let's compare that to another and we'll see which of those works better, right? If your cycle time is two to four hours, then you don't have to test entire groups of features. You can test them one at a time and individually say, oh, okay, we'll do this site layout. Should we use this kind of search box or this kind of search box? Should the search box be at the top center or on the top right or on the top left or somewhere else, right? Things like that, yeah, you can get uh, very detailed testing of all these things. So. Big consequence of shifting from standard to premium. Uh, is that faster, basically, better website uh, performance when it matters? They're able to implement those changes pretty quickly, you know, when things start to get busy. And that's great. Uh, the other thing, remember with Google Analytics standard, if you exceed the tracking limits, you only get a sample of the data, right? Not everything. But when Intuit switched, they got all the data meant they no longer had 
sample errors in their assessment of site features. So that was a big thing too. So instead of saying, well, we have a confidence interval on how good this thing is, right? And we know that it's sampled and we might have some oddball uh, subset of people that, you know, it's not quite lining up with the data. When they switched to premium, they got all the data. So if they're changing these uh, individual features, right, they're not bound by that small sample size problem nearly as much as they would be. Anyway, so again, that helps into it. Uh, do more fine-grained testing of site components and features. Okay, so that, that's the big outcome from those those two things. So that's why that's why they switched over to premium. That's what they knew they would get, and they got it, and they were happy, and life goes on. Okay, the other one I'd like to mention. Let me see here. Is sentient. Okay, so sentient is a food coloring operation. Now this one, I have a little bit of uh, a dispute on how they view the data. So it was an operation called the net impact, which offered web analytics insights to companies. So sentient food colors, they have uh, basically their situation, site visitors are not really exploring the site, even though there's a lot of information in it, right? So this is what they perceived as a problem. But I'm going to say, who's going to buy these food colors, right? So remember, Sentient, let's call it FFC, is, a, is an industrial scale food coloring vendor, right? Not the one ounce bottles you buy at the grocery, at the store. So, so people who are visiting, if they're normal individuals, they're going to leave quickly once they find out the site isn't small scale, right? Because none of us normal people, we're not gonna buy a 55 gallon barrel of blue food coloring. Where would you put it, right? I mean, that would be a great prank to do at the local swimming pool, but other than that, it wouldn't serve much purpose. So what, what happens instead? Well, so those people don't even go, they get filtered out. The other people, the food coloring professionals, chances are, they're looking for something very specific, right? They are placing or thinking about placing an order for a specific shade of a specific color. And that's all they're interested in that day, right? They don't have time. They don't have time to drift around and look at every pretty page on the site, right? They're just in and out right away. They got stuff to do. So I feel like this case that they talk about they kind of have the wrong problem. So they say the net impact people, net impact says you need to do more stuff to get people to stay on your site longer. And they have a whole big thing about all the changes they make to try to encourage people to explore the site. And I say, no, think about your customers, right? My take, that doesn't make sense, right? Your customers, these food coloring professionals, if they can go to a site and very quickly find what they're looking for and get out right away, they're going to be happy. They're going to like your site. So again, don't try to get them to explore. Just make the links 
to relevant content more accessible. And I would say in particular, uh, probably need to restructure the landing pages so that viewers can immediately access the relevant content. Right? So if you identify that somebody is looking for red food coloring, for example, your, uh, your landing page should have like, say, a wheel of spectrum of red. You find out they're looking for blue, then boom, you give them a spectrum of that. If you don't know, if you know they're looking for food colorings but don't know which color, you can give them like some kind of rainbow and say, which one of these are you looking for? And when you click on that, it'll take you to one of those color wheel landing pages. So I don't know, but this was my take. You know, they had theirs, I had mine. It is what it is. You can read it and decide for yourself. But there you go. Just because uh, somebody says something doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. Uh, so that's the thing. And I would say, again, over, over the weekend, time permitting, take a look at this Bausch and Loam one. Take a look at this Gilt one. They're similar to the other two, but they have their own unique quirks. Uh, it'll help you get a better understanding of what all this web analytics is about and how businesses actually use it. And the articles are short. They're like basically a page. So you're not taking too much out of your life to read them. Same thing for Blue Creek Cabins. It's about a page. I lifted it from a New York Times article uh, several years ago. Okay. Anyway, we're at the end of our time. We have achieved our goals. We've covered the material and that is great. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna stop the recording. And we are done.